Excellent. Welcome, everybody. Uh, I'm Laura Caps, and we're going to wait a little bit as, as folks continue to join us here. We're already at a, a wonderful number of 70 participants joining this conversation today. Um, as way, by way of background, I'm um, a former uh, board president of the Community Environmental Council, just an organization I love and support on a daily basis. And I'm also the um, president of the Santa Barbara School Board uh, here tonight. You'll have to forgive me. I'm a little, we had a seven hour meeting last night on Zoom. So I'm Zoomed out, but <laughs> we all, as we all are, but I'm gonna do my best here today to keep this conversation flowing. And the point is, this is a conversation. One of the first ways I got to know CEC as an adult, I knew it as a child growing up here in Santa Barbara, but as an adult, um, Dennis Allen invited me to one of the breakfasts about seven or eight years ago that were held at the Santa Barbara Club, um, a way to get gather the, the community together. And that's what this is. Now that we can't meet just temporarily in person, we're getting together regularly to have these webinars around very important conversations that are central to this community. And what could be more central than food? Food is an area in which I've worked for a long time. I've worked in the hunger space. Um, obviously against hunger on a national level, working with big organizations like No Kid Hungry, um, but then also here locally, uh, working with the Community Environmental Council on the Food Action Plan, which was about six years ago, um, along with the Food Bank, a way in which we looked as a county at the entire food system. We're gonna go more into that, but I just wanted to kick things off today by welcoming folks. We're gonna see folks as they come in. Um, a lot of CEC board members are here. I wish, again, I wish we could all be in person, but we're hoping to hear from you as this conversation continues and make it as interactive as possible. I'm gonna turn it over in a minute to Allegra Roth. Let me just make sure I'm um, doing all of my housekeeping bits and let you know that, um, um, that there'll be Q&A at the end of this presentation, actually about halfway through, and also that the chat box is there for any other comments you may have or resources you wanna share. Again, the emphasis is on engagement. And we have a support team here to help us, including Iris, who you all know as one of the panelists, and Katie and Kathy. Um, you can look for the name support to private message anyone for our team to help. So again, I'm gonna now turn it over officially to Allegra Roth, who is CEC's Food and Climate Program Manager. She's the co-chair also of the, of the new Santa Barbara County Food Action Network, which is the second phase of the Food Action Plan that I referenced. And she's helping to lead the network's development along alongside the new executive director, who I'm very excited to just have met a few moments ago, Shakira Miracle, and uh, Lacey uh, Valdivez at the Food Bank of Santa Barbara County, who I also work with hand in hand on hunger here in this county. So first off to Allegra, um, why don't you give us, uh, start us off by giving us some background on our food system and the need for the network. I find when I say food system, um, even with folks in the know, you have to unpack that a little bit and talk about what are we talking about when we say, when we say food system and why do we need a network? Yeah, absolutely. Thanks so much. Um, let me just share my screen quickly and pull up some slides to give you all some visuals. All right. All right. Can, okay, there it is. Perfect. Well, thanks, Laura. Um, so yeah, I'm really glad to be here with everyone today with Shakira and Julia talking about our food system and all the work happening on the ground. Um, I first wanted to just share some simple facts about our food system in general and how it met manifests in Santa Barbara County. Um, and just zooming out a little bit first, I think um, in order to really meaningfully talk about our food system, we can take a lot of lessons from the last couple months um, and kind of re-remind ourselves to talk about themes of race and, and class and language and geography and how they cut across our food system in different ways. Um, as you all know, any, any racial disparity is exacerbated during times of disaster or climate disaster or pandemic as we're experiencing. Um, and so we'll be touching on that a lot over the next hour um, and just wanted to share that we, we as an organization are really trying to be allies and um, do that work and listen to frontline communities as we do that work. Um, so 
just zooming out a little bit more to talk about our global food system. I know this is a really overwhelming graphic, um, but it just shows how complicated it is to get food to our forks in our global food system. Um, particularly in the United States, um, our food system is very global and vertical by nature. So that means that we've um, relied on consolidation of ownership over the production and over the distribution of food. And that's something that we're really trying to change, as you all know. Um, so what that means is that in a lot of ways, we've developed a supply chain and federal policies that reinforce that consolidation. Um, so that means that we have a lot of monocultures and industrial production rather than the bioregional diversity and small scale production that was the norm for centuries. Um, and so this global system has really evolved over the last 80 years or so. It's pretty new in that way. Um, and it's so, uh, I guess, embedded in our daily lives. It's really hard to imagine a world without it, let alone, re let alone create one. Um, but we're also learning that though it's efficient in some ways, it's also incredibly wasteful and vulnerable to climate disasters and other other disasters like pandemics. So we have a really big incentive to reinvent it. Um, and there's a lot of big movement, both locally and globally, to reclaim our food system and reclaim community ownership um, to really localize those processes. Uh, and so how this manifests locally um, in our county, as you all probably know, agriculture is the number one contributor to our economy. We produce over 50 fruits and veggies annually with a production value of close to $1.5 billion. Um, yet, at the, at the same time, very little of that is consumed in our county. So 95% per percent of the fruits and veggies that people eat in our county are actually imported from elsewhere. Um, there was some great research that David Cleveland did out of UCSB, and I think he, he said this really well, picture two produce-laden tractor trailers passing on the highway, one coming into the county, one going out of the county. Um, and so that just goes to show that our system is really set up for import-export and not for local consumption. Um, and just an anecdote, I was recently on a call with some folks in Lompoc Valley and K Kuyama Valley, um, and both those areas are considered some of the most productive and abundant um, regions in the country, yet they also suffer from the some of the highest rates of food insecurity. So um, yeah, there's a huge disconnect, a profound disconnect between the food that we produce in our county and our, our, our residents' ability to eat it. Um, and so we also see that disconnect um, between the, the revenue that agriculture produces in our county and the value of the people that make that production possible. So you might have heard recently that there was a strike in Santa Maria in May of about 100 farm workers uh, who were petitioning for a 25 cent increase per strawberry box that they produce. And this had to do with uh, higher rates of childcare due to COVID-19. Um, and so the farm that they worked for was contracted with Driscoll's, as you know, a huge agribusiness. Um, and unfortunately, the sheriff's department was called on them and um, the, the striking farm workers, the, the farmer threatened to call immigration um, as retaliation. And so that's just an example of how we have kind of normalized the success of businesses and agribusinesses like Driscoll's in our county built by the hands oftentimes of undocumented labor while also disregarding their demands and their needs um, to, to have a safe um, and dignified working environment. So just thought that that was an interesting and recent example worth sharing. Um, in terms, oops, there we go. In terms of food insecurity, one of, the, one of the best ways to understand the health of a food system is to measure you know, how many people uh, feel secure in their ability to provide food for their families. And so I wanted to get a read of the room here and send out a poll and ask everyone in the room, what do you think the rate of child food insecurity rate is in Santa Barbara County? So hopefully you have a poll up and give us your best answer. So child food insecurity rate will take a couple seconds more. And I'm going to just jump in, Allegra. Do you know, I'm sure you know, but which, which season of the year does child hunger 
Spike. <laughs> it's a setup. We're in it. Uh, I would say summer. I would guess summer. 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 We're in it. That's when, when, when kids are not connected to schools is the time in which the numbers go even higher. Yeah. Wow. Thanks for sharing that. Um, so, okay. So are these, these polls are being shared right now. So interesting. You all guessed 21%. It's actually 13%, 13% among children. Um, and for adults, the rate is closer to 21%. So I guess in that way, you are pretty close and on the mark. Um, and so there are also um, racial disparities amongst food insecurity. As you know, the Spanish speaking population in our county has about twice the rate of food insecurity as the non-Hispanic population. Um, and in, within the context of COVID throughout the, throughout the state of California, food insecurity has um, gone up by about 2.5 fold throughout the state. Um, and of course, within that, households with children are most impacted and is a, it's also stratified by race. So right now, 18% um, of the white population in California is food secure, while 32% of the Hispanic population is, while 36% of the black, black population is. So just a, another example of um, the, the COVID or any crisis exa exacerbating racial disparities. Um, and I just wanted to quickly share some of the resources and needs that we've come across for our food system, especially during times of disaster. Um, we are really lucky in our county. We have a year, gro year round growing season and we're able to produce a very high and diverse agricultural yield year round. Um, we also have a plethora of farms and community gardens that can be a location for um, emergency food production. Our schools and institutions, Laura knows this very well, um, can be a, a, a location for food processing and storage and production during times of disaster. We also have, as you'll learn in a little bit, uh, an excess of food and organic material that's currently being uh, wasted that we can repurpose and reclaim. Um, and of course, we have a lot of philanthropic support for systemic change as well in our county. And in terms of needs, um, again, we really do need to kind of institutionalize equitable, equitable support for our essential workers. So those most impacted during times of disaster. We've also heard a lot about the need for food storage and processing infrastructure. Um, also diversifying our transportation, so um, looking into mobile markets and food trucks. I know Lompoc is working a lot on that. Um, and yeah, kind of ensuring that our regulatory agencies are providing guidance um, to create food system change. And then during times of disaster that we're able to align our agencies and align efforts and create pathways for that collaboration. Um, and so so yeah, I look forward to hearing more from Julia and Shakira. I'll jump back in in a little bit, but I think for now we're gonna head over to Food Rescue and I'll stop sharing my screen and go back to Julia. Excellent, thanks Allegra. I will uh, introduce Julia. One of the most um, exciting newish new -ish programs that CEC has is the Food Rescue Program. And I'm, I'm excited to learn more about it. I just think it's a brilliant uh, concept of connecting excess food with the entities that need it. and so. Uh, uh, let's hear more from Julia, who runs that program, um, the, the Food Rescue, Julia Blanton. Hey, how are you doing? Give me Good. just a second here. Um, hoping you guys can see my screen. Hello. One moment. Sorry about that. All right. So yeah, I guess what I'm going to do is just start with a brief history for those of you who haven't heard about us in the past. Um, that food waste is a significant issue and environmental concern. Um, when food is wasted, all of the resources that went into producing and transporting that food are also wasted. Um, plus, when the food ends up in a landfill, it breaks down, creating methane, a potent greenhouse gas, which is contributing to climate change. Um, CEC first identified food waste as a countywide issue. Um, that needed to be solved in July of 2017. Since then, we've hosted about six community roundtables with participation from stakeholders in public, private, and nonprofit sectors on the topic of food waste and the development of Santa Barbara County Food Rescue. In November of 2017, we started a pilot program between uh, Chumash Casino and Bilton Senior Center 
um, which until March continued to rescue an average of 550 pounds monthly. Um, in April of 2018, Santa Barbara Food Rescue was launched. Um, and in May, we were awarded a CalRecycle Food Waste Prevention and Rescue Grant in partnership with Santa Barbara City College and Allen Hancock College. Um, that was to help address issues of student food insecurity on campus. Um, so before we move on, I also would like to conduct a quick poll. Um, perfect, it's up on your screen now. So just out of curiosity, do you guys know or where in the supply chain do you think food is most wasted? How are we doing, Iris? Almost there. Give a few more seconds. Yay. All right. So 47% of you um, suggested homes with 36 in consumer facing businesses. I think you're both very correct, um, close or correct. The actual numbers are here. So 40% is wasted in consumer facing businesses with 43% in the homes. So a huge part of food waste is at the end of the supply chain after everything has already gone into producing that food and, and getting it out to communities. Um, so currently where we're focusing at SBC Food Rescue is on the consumer facing business side. And this is an opportunity to capture some of that food waste and get it back um, into the hands of people. So as you can see from this chart, um, we've been growing quite rapidly. In 2018, we rescued 11,260 pounds, and this year alone, we've rescued about 81,000 pounds. In total, SBC Food Rescues rescued 118,255 pounds to date. Um, in March, I started reaching out to see how we could help and rescue food resulting from the pandemic and the disruption in the local food system. Um, and this is a significant increase. So a huge thank you to Cisco Foods for donating surplus food to and to Veggie Rescue for helping to transport this food um, to nonprofits throughout the county. Here's some food being dropped off at Food Liaison for charitable feeding, as well as a um, staff member at New Beginnings Counseling Center dropping off a meal that has been prepared with rescue food to a local veteran. So, um, in addition to rescuing surplus food and seeing how I could help place that, I started reaching out to nonprofits in our network to learn how the pandemic was affecting them and how else or what more that I could do. Um, I learned a lot of people and a lot of organizations are working in this territory, but it was hard to know who all was doing what. Um, so thanks to a grant from the Santa Barbara Foundation COVID Joint Response um, Grant, I was able to take the time and create this informational hub so that we could collect information on local efforts in order to promote collaboration and efficiency of resources, and also to help identify gaps um, of what populations might have been missed by current efforts. Um, this is how the information shows, and it is available at sbcfoodrescue.org slash hub. The website has a simple form for any organization supporting charitable food donation, delivery, or distribution during this time. So this gives them an opportunity to share what they're doing and how they could get help. Um, the collected information is available for download um, and for other organizations to view and can also be filtered on a specific area of interest. So what am I learning, learning during this uh, conversation and data collection? COVID has created unique circumstances and as the leg already mentioned, definitely amplified the food insecurity in Santa Barbara County. Um, in addition to economic hardships due to to loss of income, which is especially difficult for undocumented workers with less access to government assistance. COVID created some um, unique circumstances that highlighted an increased demand for prepared meal distribution. So parents are busier than ever with schools being closed and having to balance their child's education along with their regular day-to-day -day responsibilities. Uh, farm workers have low incomes with less flexible work conditions and are experiencing higher costs related to child care, for example, um, or, or in other areas of their life, which affects their overall budget and available funds for purchasing food. Um, they also often live in single family homes with multiple families and having to worry about that added um, stress of a shared kitchen and a potential exposure in using their kitchen. Others who may rent space without kitchen access and previously relied on 
shared meals, family meals, or eating with friends also have more limited options now since people aren't congregating. Uh, senior citizens who have historically needed help or, or might be low income have been very resistant to accepting that help because it gives them the feeling of a lack of independence. Um, but now, due to health concerns, they're starting to accept the help that they really needed all along. Um, so with having this help and realizing how critical and how helpful it is in their lives, the groups serving this population are expecting the increased demand for prepared meal services and other services for senior citizens to remain. Um, data here shows, or shared by the Hope Center for College and Community Justice, shows that 44% of students at two-year institutions are experiencing food insecurity. This aligns with local information. Um, at the end of March, the Santa Barbara City College Foundation launched an emergency grant program, and of the 2,300 students who applied, 40% requested funds specifically for food and groceries. 100% um, were requesting funds for basic needs like rent, food, and medical access. Um, I also learned that the shelter in place orders very quickly took, a, um, took when they took effect, they had a very quick um, impact on the ability of people experiencing homelessness to access some of the resources that they were reliant upon. Um, additionally, this population could be increasing with the number of renters that are facing evictions without having the income to pay rent in the last couple of months. Um, I realize this is a lot of information and a bunch of pop populations, but it just goes to show how complex the issue is and how many different people are affected by food insecurity. Um, so one result from the conversations that we were having with some partners was the formation of a community food collaborative. Um, this multi-sector partnership is working to address hunger with the vulnerable populations and unsheltered populations in Santa Barbara, while also supporting the small businesses and food enterprises, restaurant workers, those um, are a critical underpinning of our local food system. So some of the, or the partners are listed here on the page. In the first two months, the collaborative served 4,570 meals um, to unsheltered veterans and low-income neighbors in Santa Barbara. And another 2,200 meals are projected to be delivered by July 28th. Um, a big thank you to the supporters of that program. Um, also during distributions, our partners learned that there was still a need for non-perishable food. So a offshoot food bag collaborative was created and they provided a thousand bags or grocery bags in the first two weeks. Um, doctors with walls, without walls shared that the goal is to distribute 7,200 bags of non-perishable food before August 31st. So together, these efforts aim to provide options for the people being served. Um, you can donate or access more information at sbf.org slash cfc. All right, so SBC Food Rescue. Thinking ahead and how SBC Food Rescue can continue to help and address food insecurity. My goal is to develop a program into a robust countywide network, bringing together food rescue efforts and providing structure for a safe and collaborative network that can maximize efficiency in food recovery and resources. Um, last year, with support of the Natalie Orfila Foundation, CEC completed a community kitchens mapping project. Um, SBC Food Rescue plans to use this information to grow and include a network of food recovery kitchens. That way we can rescue food, get it to a kitchen, re-prepare it as necessary, repackage it, and get it um, out to individuals who, who can eat that food, maximizing food. ...or enabled us to purchase the channel match food recovery software. Julia, I think we're having a little bit of issue with your audio. Um, it sounds like something's messing with your mic. If you can just restart for a second. We lost those last couple sentences. No, no, okay. Um, can you hear me now? Yes, we can. <laughs> okay, perfect. Um, so I was just explaining that last year we, CEC completed a community a mapping community kitchens project and we hope to use this information to create a network of recovery kitchens in Santa Barbara, throughout Santa Barbara, so we can use rescued food to prepare meals, repackage meals, and extend its shelf life and maximize the amount of food that can get out and serve individuals. Um, we also with the COVID Joint Response Grant from Santa Barbara Foundation, purchased food recovery software, Chow Match, to help with the transportation logistics. Um, in the future, we hope to engage volunteer drivers to support in the food recovery process. Um, and the software will also be able to support routing for nonprofits that are taking um, on home delivery of food. So overall, this network will help us minimize food waste, reduce charitable feeding costs, and feed more people. 
already um, I'm grateful and thankful to the Living Peace Foundation, the Natalie Orfila Foundation, and the Benson Foundation for providing funds so that we can continue this work for the next year. So thank you for that. And thank you everyone for your time and listening to what we're doing at SBC Food Rescue. Thanks, Julia. That was great. I uh, really appreciate getting up to speed. Uh, so we are up to almost 100 participants here. And I just want to, um, I bet that a good portion of them were, of you folks, were part of the Food Action Plan, which was published in 2016. Uh, if, you, if you weren't, I can just give you a brief overview that if, like me, I was part of that process. I was part of the stakeholder process. I had the privilege of working on that with folks like Sharon Main and Eric Tolkien, of course, Sigrid, right? And it was chaired at the time uh, by then Supervisor Carbajal and um, our current supervisor, Lavinino. And the community really came together to put together a robust plan with stakeholders. There was meetings, there was months and months of planning. And if you were like me, this feeling is always kind of with you when you're part of these processes of, okay, then what? We don't want this plan to just sit on a shelf. <laughs> we've done all this work. We've galvanized people. We've made them aware of our hunger issues, of our transportation issues, of that staggering statistic that 95% of what we grow here is actually exported and we import, et cetera. So then what? Well, we're here to tell you about the then what, because we now have transitioned the Food Action Plan into a Food Action Network. So I wanna turn that over to Allegra to bring us up to speed even further and give everyone the update. Great, yeah. So I will pull up my slides again. I will screen share a fun little mix. <laughs> okay. Okay, yes. So um, yeah, you all, some of you might be familiar with the Food Action Network, but I will just kind of expand on what Laura shared with the history of the Food Action Plan. Um, so a lot of what we're doing right now is based off of work that happened in the past while also kind of building foundations for new relationships and new structures. Um, so as Laura mentioned, the Food Action Plan was developed in 2016 and was really seen at the time as a, a blueprint for improving our food system. So it laid out 16 different goals um, from you know, the way we produce our food to how we distribute it, to who consumes it and why, to um, food waste management, to food policy, to food education. So it really took a bird's eye view of all the different systems that, um, that could use some improvement. So um, there were 16 goals and kind of focused on these four themes, investing in our food economy, investing in our health and wellness, investing in our community, and investing in our food shed. Um, and so again, we had the, the food bank, the Santa Barbara Foundation and Community Council kind of leading that charge. Um, so that really sparked a lot of action. Um, so since 2016, we've made a lot of progress in implementing that plan um, through a partnership with, again, the Santa Barbara Foundation and other funders, we were able to fund dozens of um, pilot projects and initiatives that implemented various parts of the plan. Here are just four of them that I wanted to highlight. So we had the um, food rescue pilot that now turned into the food rescue program that Julia just talked about. There was this really great veggie prescription program um, between the Sansom Diabetes Clinic and Fairview Gardens called Farming for Life that prescribed vegetables to diabetes patients. Um, there was a, we helped launch a farmer's market up in Lompoc Valley, um, Route 1 Farmer's Market, you might be familiar with it, and then um, doing all sorts of educational events around food security on college campuses and many more. Um, and when I say we, I don't mean I, I mean dozens and dozens of partners um, who spent many hours in you know, late night emails making that happen. Um, and so fast forward to 2020, uh, we have lots of wins to point to, and um, we're really wanting to now kind of improve the connectivity and collaboration between the food system actors and those projects that didn't necessarily collaborate before. Um, so we're really focusing now on this network building, so creating a web of collaborators countywide um, and building regional partnerships between folks that hadn't necessarily worked before together. Um, and so what that means for us is that we are um, expanding our leadership team and diversifying our leadership team. 
Um, so we have 13 different agencies, nonprofits, uh, businesses, all on our kind of leadership committee. Um, and what we're really hoping to do in the next six months, we were this year had a different plan, of course, and then COVID came in and shook things up. Um, but we're really trying to build food system membership from the ground up and ensuring every voice has a seat at the table. Um, and so by, by expanding our, our leadership committee, we're really trying to, um, to make that inclusivity, make that a meaningful, inclusive process. Um, and so in the end, what we're really hoping to do is fulfill all the goals of the food action plan to some extent and build local markets for local products and make sure that um, they're equitably accessible. Um, and yeah, we're making progress slowly but surely. Um, I really encourage you to take a look at our food action website, sbcfoodaction.org. You can follow us on Instagram and Facebook. Um, and yeah, we're really trying to make this website a hub for resources and events and news. And so you as just a regular community member could submit a news source or something that you want to share with the community. Um, and you can also access all the various resources and projects that have been mentioned so far, including that community kitchen map that Julia mentioned as well. Um, and so I think that's it for me. Happy to answer any other questions about the Food Action Network. Um, I'll just, yeah, I think so much of it is about partners. And so thank you to everyone who's listening that have been part of this process altogether. Um, it's, yeah. It, we aren't the network, you're the network. Just got to say that in the end. And I know Shakira will talk about that too as well. Um, so yeah, Laura, back to you. I'll stop screen sharing. Well, with that, um, yeah, I'm, I'm pleased to introduce the new executive director of the Food Action Network. Uh, one of the best names I've ever heard, Shakira Miracle. I'm happy to meet you uh, this morning and, and introduce you to here to our community and folks you haven't quite met yet. But I'm going to start you off with a question. Um, we can talk about your position, and but I really, you know, the, the title of this conversation is about um, uh, shockproofing our food system. And gosh, you know, there's this COVID is obviously this massive earthquake shock level, but I am, my work has been focused on the daily shocks of the fact that this county has the second highest poverty rate in the state and people just can't um, put food on their table. Um, so can you speak to how uh, you see in your role what, what we do to prepare for these next shocks. We had the Thomas fire recently. Now, obviously we have COVID, uh, we have kids out of school. What are, how do we shock proof our food system? Thank you so much, Laura. Um, this is a big question. And I think it's important as a network to start by looking at more of a 30,000 square foot, 30,000 foot viewpoint down Remember that there's already been a degree of resilience that's been built over these last several years. There have been so many incredible human beings who have taken the initiative to address a myriad of shocks. It's confusing when you say we have the second highest poverty rate in the state. It is. What I'm going to do over the next several minutes is to take everybody from that 30,000 foot viewpoint down in deeply to the weeds and tell you what I've been hearing um, from stakeholders on the food system throughout the community. I am going to name a few specific stakeholder groups, but I always say to people when they ask me what in terms of a food system, can I possibly do? What role do I have on the food system? I always start with, do you eat? All right, well then you participate on the food system. Keep that in mind. There is this rub between scarcity and abundance. And throughout our country and worldwide, there is such a level of scarcity. And yet in Santa Barbara County, keep in mind two things. Food is our number one resource. That can mean a myriad of things, especially that it means we are a community or a group of communities of abundance. So our role as community members in this region is managing 
abundance. And what does that look like? Um, it can mean uh, many things, including sharing, including globalized localization, meaning more specifically that we secure our regional supply chain. We put that oxygen mask on our communities first. So then therefore we can go outside of our region and put that mask on other communities. We make sure everybody's got a seat at the dinner table. Every seat at this table, there's a different unique individual voice. Each one of them have something to share that each of us needs to hear and learn from and therefore exchange resources and abilities. On that note, I wanna talk about two areas that I'm hearing themes on in the last few months from our um, county. One in terms of addressing the shock now and addressing the shock in the future is diversification. And I'll talk a bit more about that in a moment. The other piece of this is repurposing doing what so many have done, what Julia and her team are doing. Laura, what you've been doing all along, what our incredible funders like Natalie Orfala Foundation, Santa Barbara Foundation have been doing already, is, and Food Bank, I mean, I could go on and on. It's incredible. Um, again, the abundance of talent, knowledge, skill set that we have in this county. It's about bringing those together, working in alignment as Allegra touched on earlier, and then making sure that the work that we've been doing is properly stewarded, meaning put into a more codified plan, policy, so that when another shock comes, we can take the abundance of resources that we have and knowledge base from the past and from what we have now and repurpose those resources and skill sets so that we can address emergent needs and then at the same time, our mid and long-term needs. So I wanna talk a bit first about things I've been learning from uh, our fisheries. So our uh, fishermen throughout the county. Kim Selko, who is an amazing champion of uh, fishermen throughout our county, associated with both Get Hooked and the Commercial Fisheries Association. She says something that I found very wise when addressing the shock now and the shocks to come. Make friends before you need friends. What she said in conjunction with that to me is that the Food Action Network has helped them tremendously through COVID by aligning with other stakeholders outside of the fishermen and the fisheries to be able to leverage our resources, our capacities, so that we can come alongside one another and share and support. Specifically, what they have learned throughout COVID, which is key in terms of our building towards the future, is that those fishermen who were already linked to local markets, markets and consumers, were able to adapt. Right. Definitely makes sense to me. Those who were selling strictly to large scale buyers couldn't access alternative markets. So Allegra talked earlier about this amazingly huge and complex global supply chain. And among that, there are only specific locations for processing and distribution way far from where we are and what we're doing. And yet we have one of the most abundant and diverse seafood in all of the United States. Some would argue the world. We have a couple of very specific types of seafood that are only grown in our channel and you can't grow them anywhere else. It's incredible what you learn when you get involved with the network, guys. Please join us. That being said, keep in mind that the local and direct to consumer supply chains that were in place have thrived. If anything, I wanna be clear, not just survived, thrived. We've gotta keep building those guys. We've gotta secure our regional supply chain. We've gotta get direct access to consumers. 
Another area in terms of fishermen that we have learned through this process of not just COVID, previous shocks, but we know that we have to codify and solidify as we go forward is processing hubs. So I'll talk about that specifically to other sectors in a moment, but I wanna talk specifically obviously about fishermen. You can imagine that seafood is a unique animal, if you will, and so it's challenging to share a location with other types of processing. I mean, for obvious reasons, we don't have to go into it today. Not everybody has eaten yet. But th that being said, keep in mind that one of the steps the Commercial Fishermen Association have already taken is applying to the USDA for a local food promotion program grant so that they can come continue to build upon the concept of Get Hooked, which is a more flattened model of direct to consumer access where people get a member, it's very similar to CSA, where they get a membership every month and then they have this incredible assortment that is sent to them, it's very affordable. So by finding, securing and building out a processing hub for fishermen, we can do a myriad of things, including having one lo locale for storage, for processing, for distribution out, and possibly even sales on site. We need real estate for that purpose. I'm now going to shift to businesses, if you don't mind. So what have I been hearing from businesses throughout the county? There are definite themes that are coming up. The first theme is, it's interesting how when you live, especially those of you, like Laura was talking about, multi-generation, you know, this, this is where you know, or what, where you've been, what you know. Sometimes we take for granted what's in our own backyard, what's right on the edge of our noses, right? Santa Barbara is a destination. Kuyama is a destination. Santa Maria North, destination. And we need to start remembering that our communities throughout the county are brands in and of themselves. If you could think in terms of diversification of businesses, let's imagine the idea of e-tourism. Now, what do I mean by that? So rather than a reliance on local consumer base, let's look outward. Businesses with an online presence have been getting orders from literally all over the world in the midst of COVID. This was fascinating to me. One example is a local gift basket packer and seller of locally made products. Customers were ordering for themselves and locals who were friends and family. Let us remember again, food, food is not just medicine. It is not just life, it is what connects us. It is culture, it is those loving memories, it's nostalgia. Having a diversification of products that are food-based for our businesses uh, to distribute provides a whole other channel of business opportunities, revenue models that speak to who we are, where we're from, and especially in times of great shock, when we're not able to be mobile. Keep that in mind. Another one that's very low-lying fruit, it's been common for a long time, but we've got to address it, are rents. Now, of course, that is specific to certain areas of our county, but important. Local businesses are competing with very high costs and competing with corporate entities I'm saying something that we know, but I wanna say it again to emphasize. Corporations don't build into local culture. They can't build into a sense of community. And many of them are spending profits somewhere else. They're pulling profits and investing elsewhere, spending elsewhere. Providing safety nets, if you will, of various kinds builds community it builds resilience long-term. So then once there's another shock, they're more likely to hold up and we're gonna be able to help hold them up. 
because they'll have less barriers in terms of their overhead and they won't be just treading water anymore. They'll be up here floating with us, right guys? Another area for businesses that I've been hearing are logistics and delivery. We need a regional, a regional delivery system. It's low carbon footprint based. It can distribute in each community throughout our region. So think about the desert areas of Kuyama and the unique food products that they grow and produce. Then you can think of course of the coast and seafood fisheries. And then you can think of the abundance of North County and areas of South County, wine, I mean, and, and the diversification of those types of products as well. Finally, repurposing. Again, I want to, I've talked about this earlier, and I want to reiterate, we want to make sure that we codify the incredible work that we do. So when I'm talking to the Bucket Brigade, and they're coming to me with incredible innovative ideas, how we can collectively address some of these food gaps. The first thing I remind them, specifically of civil leadership, is make sure you're writing down and distributing what you've learned. We need to get systems in place and secured so that it is as simple as, as soon as Julia has an emerging issue, I can say, Bucket Brigade, make sure that we are sending over to Food Rescue systems and processes that worked for you. Vice versa, food rescue has learned an abundance, literally and figuratively, of information. They have tons of information that they can share and they build into systems. Finally, and I know I'm going long as I do, sorry everybody, farmers, it's just, it's amazing learning information, guys. What are farmers saying? And producers, meat producers, for example, cold storage. I can't reiterate this enough. We need cold storage all over the county. We're talking short-term emergency shock situations to our food system. We're talking mid-term where you have a meat, a meat producer, for example, lamb, poultry, beef, pork, who needs short-term holding so that they can scale how many of each animal that they are able to raise and then process. And long-term, where we can start selling out outside of our region once we secure the needs of those who are eating within our county and diversify some of those revenue channels there. Um, again, want to also emphasize that we're talking about meat producers, seafood needs this as well. And again, emergency response. So another area, Julia talked about um, the community kitchen scan, incredible information that was uh, created from that. There's another way that we can leverage that information, specifically to then find going and building relationships with each of these community kitchens to find out what their cold storage capabilities are. Let's start talking to those churches. Let's start talking to those schools. Let's start creating new policies and overcome some of the regulatory barriers that are when we have shock situations, emergency situations, that we're able to have agreements already in place so that we can access some of these either underutilized or non-utilized cold storage spaces so that we're not just building out cold, new cold storage, but we're also, again, managing our abundance. And then, uh, very important, we talked earlier I shared earlier about the, I feel like I'm talking with you folks about the fisheries and in terms of those who were able to secure local and direct to consumer supply chains and then those who couldn't and then therefore were really suffering. All of our producers and farmers need direct to consumer access. And one way that we can do this is an online purchasing platform and hub that will be owned, so a backbone organization to own that, to facilitate it, so that it won't cut into individual overhead. Remember, our farmers, our producers, they have very thin margins. Again, holding up everyone, right? Streamlining delivery, that's a big lack, that's a gap. Um, it's not just about distribution points, but each individual consumer, if you can't leave your home, how can we get those deliveries to you? 
And again, with this overcoming pre-selected produce. So there's so many benefits to CSAs, but then there's also the added benefit. Yes, did you, Laura, did you have something you want to say? I just want to, we just have some questions and your oh, enthusiasm. Sure. Is, I just want to give you a, you finish your thought. Um, we just, but we're, people need to, we just have a few more minutes, eight more minutes. So just, oh, yeah. I knew this was going to happen. Okay, so ultimately I'll close with this. Perfect. Uh, in terms of another shock, we yeah. need food processing hubs all over the county to diversify our product base so that we are creating value-added products. Guys, imagine this. What if we, our city, our communities, Santa Maria, Lompoc, all over Mid-County, uh, Carpinteria and beyond, if we, rather than went to the grocery store, our county made flour, pasta, pickled goods, it's set canned fish, cured meats, we can do this and we can secure our regional system and then have additional revenue models out. One example is um, specifically to meat producers is a mobile processing unit so that they don't have the overhead individually and it would go from location to location. I could go on and on. Laura, take it before I take it back. Okay, okay, I'm gonna, we have a great question. Thank you, Shakira, that was great. Uh, from Sandy Grasso Boyd, I'm gonna discipline us to answer it in one sentence. What can individuals, and each person gets to answer, what can individuals do in their daily practice to support our work? Allegra, take it, one sentence. Um, first, visit our website, check it out, and compost your food waste at home, and think about it, and write about it, and share your story while doing it. Okay, long run-on sentence. Okay, Julia, one sentence. How can, uh, how can people help? People can share um, food rescue with their favorite restaurant or grocery store to encourage participation. Um, I'll leave it at one sentence. <laughs> Excellent. Shakira, one sentence. Talk Remember about that what we do needs resources in order to continue long-term sustainable funding. Excellent. I'm going to take the liberty to answer. On summer hunger, there are 50 places where any child can get a free meal this summer. Most people don't know about it. Helping to get the word out. I put the texting number on the chat. Thank you for that question. Okay, um, we have a, some awesome ones here. Hannah Eckberg, hello Hannah. What efforts are happening to teach people about growing some of their own food and creating food security that way? Who wants to take this one? <laughs> and these are, this is like the end of the CEC where we're just doing pop-ups. We're gonna make this real fast so we can get to as many as possible. So growing food, who wants to answer it? Um, I don't know of an organization that's leading that. I might be misinformed. I do know that if you're interested in this, you can take classes through Santa Barbara City College in their horticulture department, very affordable. They're online right now, um, but that's a great way to learn about it. Uh, did anyone else have thoughts on who's doing this locally? I do know that Bucket Brigade wants to initiate victory gardens, and part of doing those victory gardens would be um teaching and therefore championing um also the design to, based on seasons and and uh, growing models so that's important and also always the uh, uh permaculture group i'm also seeing on the chat here that um oscar carmona is offering a free class at city college that starts june 30th fairview gardens is working to build Great. this resource that's awesome okay and josh kenchel had a uh, Kind of a follow-up question away where can we take compost if we don't have yards or garden space at home that's a good question i know we're working on solutions right now um there's some ideas about being able to drop off compost in certain areas we're just not quite there yet um allegra do you have any other information before COVID-19 hit, we were talking with the city of Santa Barbara about doing this at the local farmer's market. So be, people being able to bring their produce or their um, food waste to the farmer's market. I'm sure there are some community gardens um, that might accept this, but I don't know any off the top of my head. We can do some research and send that in the follow, follow up email to everyone. And we have information here from Katie Hirschfeld, which is if you live in Isla Vista, you can have your compost picked up at your house. That's incredible. Okay, so um, let's see. What uh, I'm going to take this question from Ed Seaman about 
supporting the small and lifestyle farmers that everything is based on? What, what, what kind of support structures exist there? How can we help farmers? Not a simple question. <laughs> I, will, I will speak to that though, um, because it's a great question. Part of what uh, the network is all about is the three areas, connecting, aligning, and activating. So in all of the questions that have been mentioned, um, in the midst of building out the infrastructure internally, we're building our membership, but also working groups on specific projects. Uh, and so in terms of what you can do with your own gardening and so forth, it's important to keep in mind that um, there are opportunities on the fly, opportunities that, are, that we hear about all the time. And so we'll be getting more of that information out, but please go to the website, sbcfoodaction.org and contact us because then we can also make sure that we contact you directly as very specific opportunities arise. Thank you. So um, in addition to composting, Janice Knight has a question if 43% of food waste happens at home, what programs are in place to help this problem? So in addition to composting, how do we, especially maybe with uh, families with kids, what's, what's, uh, what's your wisdom there? Um, I think we would be advocating for standardized date labeling to prevent confusion with um, expiration dates. And that's something that legislation is looking at. I'm not sure the current status of that. Um, we will also be building out our food rescue website to include resources on that people can refer to about best practices to reduce food waste in their home, such as shopping their refrigerator before they go to the grocery store, um, and, and a lot of lo little tips that we can share um, and we will have on our website within the next couple of days. Yeah, I just have to say, I feel like with COVID, I, I hate to admit more food waste because we're, one, we're not sharing as much uh, in the family. And also I'm buying, I, you know, buying in such bulk and in advance. And so things are going bad, you know, just the timing is, is more challenging. I just will share that. So it's a, it's a tough time, I think, for waste in general in this pandemic. Absolutely. And you're not the only one. We, I just attended another webinar where they were talking specifically about that, how our purchase, purchasing has changed during COVID and how that's affecting uh, food waste. Um, so unfortunately, it's an issue that we'll just have to, to tackle um, and encourage people to self-educate. Yep. Okay, thanks. We're, we're out, coming up at the time, but I wanted to take a couple more questions, at least one more. Uh, this is from Abe Powell of Bucket Brigade. What challenges, opportunities would the local charitable food distribution network face if community charitable produce production increased significantly over the next nine months? So Julia, do you want to take that one? I feel like you're best connected. Yeah, absolutely. I imagine that many local nonprofits that are doing feeding, which there is a significant amount, could benefit from that surplus food. Um, I would like to talk to you more about ideas and, and connecting to those nonprofits. Um, accessing the informational hub will also share with you who is working in that territory so you could reach out to them directly about connecting them with this um, produce. Um, but yeah, absolutely. Uh, there's a lot of need for especially produce and charitable feeding. I might add also storage. So then when you have all of this amazing food, how do you preserve it? And then where do you put it while you're waiting to distribute it? Mm -hmm. Excellent. So we have Sharon Main asking a big question, but an important one. What's needed in the, in the policy area or private sector investment mm. to assist local growth? Too simple to answer quickly, but do your best. Um, my immediate answer would be to um, invest in food system infrastructure like Shakir is talking about. It's not the sexiest thing in the world, but having the ability to process, cure, can food is an investment opportunity. Um, and I think it's something that all growers could benefit from. So back to Ed's question about investing in the small farm sector, I know that he needs to transport um, some of his products up to San Luis Obispo County in order to get it processed. Um, and I think we need to create, yeah, local infrastructure so that that transportation doesn't have, have to happen. And I think there's a lot of investment interest and opportunity in that. I'd like to very briefly also say that in terms of policy, 
we need to circle back with our county representatives on looking at um, some of the barriers that producers and farmers have identified that have either hindered their ability to access consumers um, or the, and hindered their ability to either store, process, or distribute. Excellent. Well, ladies, we are right at 1232 and um, it was a great conversation. I'm going to wrap it up here and thank everybody. We had such a great group. I love seeing all the names. I wish I could see you in person. Um, people like Dick Jensen and Carl Hutter, my old friends, John Steed. Thanks so much for everyone to be here. I just want to give some reminders that we will be uh, sending out this link uh, with the recording and also the, the links to the websites that were referenced. Um, so please uh, check your email for that. Please share with your network and thank you so much for coming. Uh, it's so good to be together the way that we can be together and to talk about the, the entity that brings us all together and that we participate in the system with every day and that's food. So thank you to Allegra, Shakira and Julia and to the staff of the amazing Community Environmental Council. It's such an wonderful organization full of great people. Thanks to all of you for joining. And with that, we'll say happy Wednesday. Bye. Bye, Bye everybody. Thank you.